Oh, attention, cockers, slayers of subluxation, unleashers of the imprisoned impulse. Welcome to another episode of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown, where each week we break down the most relevant chiropractic science and philosophy to empower you to change the health of your community from the inside out. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Pellegrino from CairoEdge, and I'm here with our guest today, Dr. John Hart, um, who has a lot of experience in research, adaptability, upper cervical, HRV, pulse pressure, all of the above. So we're gonna dive into some of that different stuff. If you like slang subluxation, you're gonna wanna stay on uh, and listen to the whole thing. As you guys know, um, one of the things that I like to do is take this information, put it into a digestible um, newsletter format for you to utilize and hand out to your community to stimulate not only referrals, but retention and let them actually know what the story is and the science behind it. So if you guys want in on that, go to CairoEdgeMedia.com. So Dr. Hart, I had the absolute pleasure of getting ready for this and going through and just kind of going through your Cairo index um, and seeing what you've published on over the last couple of years. So for those of you guys who don't know, um, Dr. Hart's published on, actually we had Dr. Kessinger on here a couple weeks ago talking about pulse pressure findings following upper cervical care. Dr. Hart's listed as an author there. We have analysis and adjustment of vertebral subluxation as a separate and distinct identity for the chiropractic profession. So that's exciting. Short-term stability of resting pulse rates, testing and dissociation between baseline resting pulse averages and short-time changes in resting pulse rates. Chiropractic identity, role, and future, a survey of North American chiropractic students. So everything that we stand for here, from neurology to autonomic change to the principle to subluxation focus to getting rid of all of the crud in chiropractic and focusing on the one thing, Dr. Hart has done a lot with that. Um, he also has a consulting service that we're going to talk about where if you guys want to give back and get started in doing research out of your own practice, he will help you do that. Did I miss anything there, Dr. Hart? I think you covered the high points there. Absolutely. Also, uh, researcher at Sherman for 22 years before he retired, and like any good chiropractor, went back into practice post-retirement because when you, when you are a chiropractor, you are a chiropractor, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm excited about that. So the study that we are going to be jumping into today, uh, your solo author on, it's called Heart Rate Variability Following Spinal Adjustment, a practice-based study. Now, I've been I know I've been talking for a little bit, and everybody's not here to hear me. They're here to hear you. One of the things that before we dive in, um, I told you I wanted to go through and read was I think that the very first paragraph of this article, which was published uh, in the Internet Journal of Neurology, which is cool because it's not just a chiropractic journal. It's a neurology journal. Yeah. The very first paragraph I think is one of the easiest and most ap clinically applicable descriptions of what heart rate variability is and its application to chiropractic. So I'm just going to read this word for word because I think it does a better job of me explaining it and then we're going to dive in. So you said the autonomic nervous system controls many vital functions including heart rate. By controlling vital functions, the ANS is a major contributor to a key element of good health adaptability. There's that A word there we use all the time, adaptability. Controlled by the medulla oblongata in the ANS, heart rate is mediated by two different nerve supplies, a parasympathetic supply, which decreases the rate as needed, and a sympathetic supply, which increases the rate as needed. Consequently, heart rate variability has a natural and healthy variation of time between beats, this variability reflects a coordinating effect by the autonomic nervous system to respond to internal and external challenges to the body, and these challenges occur even in the resting heart rate. I love it. I think that makes so much sense. So looking at that, just to dive in, we're going to talk about the study itself, but it seems as though cardiovascular function, heart rate variability, looking through everything you've published on, Dr. John, has been a really big focus of yours over the last 20 something years. Um, why do you think heart rate variability specifically in research is so just important beyond this paragraph to the chiropractic profession? Well, there's uh, a lot of support for even simple resting heart rate 
as a, a neurological indicator. And to me, anything that is neurological helps the subluxation based chiropractor decide when and when not to adjust or looking at it another way, how well, how much progress the patient is making from a neurological, which can be said a chiropractic standpoint, and not, not just uh, structural, but uh, more importantly, the neurological health of, in the body and in particular, the autonomic health. And I started getting interested in heart rate um, around the year 2011 when I figured out what my last name was, just kidding on that. <laughs> and I noticed my resting heart rate was high. It was about 80 beats per minute. And I, that got me, that got my attention. And uh, reading on, uh, reading about heart rate variability and, and um, started taking my own heart rate variability with a three lead unit and uh, found that was not doing so hot either. And so I started paying, paying closer attention uh, to those indicators. Prior to that, uh, I, I was getting uh, good chiropractic care with um, other indicators, leg checks and thermal pattern analysis. But adding this dimension, I, I think, uh, added a little bit uh, more uh, specificity, particularly when to adjust. That's kind of a, a key factor for me when the timing of an adjustment and, and it's nothing new. I'm not the first person to think, think about the timing. It, this goes back to BJ Palmer and Lyle Sherman. So um, going back to 1920s when uh, the neural kilometer came in, and uh, so this idea of timing of an adjustment is uh, an important part of our history, the clinical practice history of, of uh, chiropractic. So today, I've got my heart rate, resting heart rate down and heart rate variability up. And, and uh, some of that is due to, in the last couple of years, I've taken up uh, running and that's also uh, a factor. There's a lot of things that can affect heart rate. And I explain this to patients and I also explain the thing I look for as a, a cause of this is the spine. I look to see if you have misal any misalignment in the spine. And usually I think patients have a, a misalignment, but they don't always have uh, disturbance in their nervous system. You know, I like to check patients, uh, new patients, a couple times in a row to see what uh, kind of trend they're on, see if uh, their numbers are getting better, worse, or the same from the previous visit, rather than uh, unless uh, the numbers are really looking bad on that first visit. But a lot of times it's kind of borderline. That's interesting. That's interesting. I've, I've, I've heard, heard, and, and a lot of times we talk about utilizing. <clears throat> uh, heart rate variability as an outcome measure. Uh, I had never actually heard or looked at it as actually using at a, at a, a timing of an adjustment, almost like if a patient's in pattern or not. How do you, just for my own purposes, how do you utilize that for, for like, what do you look for, for to let you know, A, it's time to adjust for this person's not adapting and need an adjustment? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. And a good point that you make that uh, HRV is, um, traditionally used as an outcome measure and probably like every six visits or or even every visit um, how's the patient looking after the adjustment it might they might uh, get the reading before the adjustment but like you your question how is it used for uh, deciding when to adjust and that's that's something I've added to my practice not only as an outcome measure to see how they're doing, uh, in general, but uh, this helped me helping me decide if they need an adjustment. There's published normative data on heart rate variability, what healthy people, what their HRV looks like. In uh, these are medical studies, people without cardiovascular disease and so forth, and the, the numbers are there, and 
for example, uh, one of the time domain measures in heart rate variability that I use, the one I focus on is uh, RM, RMSSD, the root mean square of successive differences between beats. And uh, for healthy adults, the bottom number is about 25 and the unit is milliseconds. So if a patient comes to me and is um, uh, 20 or 15 or 10, I, I see that. I had a patient recently, eight. So uh, that's, that's not looking good. It's a, a sluggish nervous system and I, I show patients their numbers. I use an app-based HRV. The patient uh, wears a sensor on the ear and it sends a Bluetooth signal to an app on my phone and the setup agrees well with uh, regular EKG. And I, I explain those studies to the patient and in the paper we're talking about, I cite those studies. So I'm, I'm uh, satisfied that it's accurate, even though it's quote, only an app. I, I think uh, other healthcare professionals, medical professionals are, are using app-based where appropriate, where accurate. And um, so I use the, that uh, number 25. And if it's below that, there, it's suspicious. If it's 24, I might have that new patient come in a second time. If it's still 24, then they're probably going to uh, be adjusted, assuming I find a misalignment. And some patients are... Uh, they come in and they're, I had a patient yesterday, it was his uh, third visit, and a new patient uh, three visits ago, and I couldn't quite decide if he needed an adjustment. And yesterday's visit, he had one of the best showings of resting heart rate, it was like uh, 47 beats a minute, and his HRV, the the R, the root mean square measure, that was about 100. And so the, for me, there's no way I'm gonna put a thrust into his spine. And I, I've um, seen that enough that when the patient's doing pretty good and I give a thrust into the spine, usually their numbers are not looking as good after the adjustment compared to before. And uh, interestingly, there's usually no symptoms involved. The patient really doesn't feel anything. But then, as you know, that doesn't necessarily mean true health. And I sometimes compare that to uh, high blood pressure. We really don't feel that, but it's a risk, risk indicator. But uh, thankfully, thanks to the body's ability to uh, maintain itself, sometimes in spite of my bad timing, the patient usually snaps out of that. If, if not, I find that uh, when I readjust them, kind of clean up my mess, they, they typically come out of it. But that's, um, that's part of uh, uh, live and learn. And uh, that's, that's the way it goes. That's just really fascinating. That's just really fascinating. Do you mind sharing um, it, what app you actually use? Sure. What's the name of the the name of the app is Heart Rate Variability Logger. Oh, that's right. That's okay. You actually wrote that in the study. Yeah, and that was developed by a PhD scientist in Italy, and he's a really good about answering emails. He'll answer the email within a couple hours, I find, and whether it's a weekend, and I've, I've had a lot of questions. Now, now my questions are tapering off. I, I think I've got all my questions asked now. And and, uh, and then the, the sensor is called a Kyto ear clip, K-Y-T-O, and that's in the paper too. And um, as I mentioned, it, it's a Bluetooth setup, and I've, I've used it now consistently since uh, the last year and a half or so, and happy with it. 
Yeah, that, that's, that's really cool. I think um, I'm just looking at it. So the heart, the one of the monitors that he recommends, I saw you have the ear clip. Um, yeah. He recommends like the uh, Polar H7 Bluetooth, he says is the most accurate for him. And that's 80 bucks. Um, the app itself is... Um, the app is free. The app is free. Looking at it, he says yeah, it's F better on iPhone than Android. Um, so that's a really good option for people who obviously, I mean, we were talking about beforehand, I use thermal SEMG, I, I, I love CLA and I, I, I really like the graphical representation that they have of HRV, but yeah. for somebody who doesn't want to drop, I don't know, I don't remember what the latest price is, but you know, three thirty five hundred dollars on an HRV unit. Yeah. It's a $70 heart rate monitor that if you don't like, you can use for yourself while you go on the treadmill. It's yeah. gonna, isn't a bad investment. You have already got the phone and you yeah. can start to track things like this. What is it? A three minute time collection? It, uh, it can go as short as 30 seconds. I do uh, two 30 second measures. So I have two numbers and um, I think uh, the app is still free. It was when I started it. If not, it's it's going to be less than ten dollars. I think. Yeah, I'm just looking at the Android Play Store because I'm an Android guy, and it's free on there. So I'm sure it's free on iPhone too. Um, but that's huge. That's great, and I, I think that's really cool. And what you were just saying, and it's 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 amazing how this kind of comes full circle. Is um, I have been looking at and research. We actually had people on here who talk about instead of just an outcome measure, using HRV, um, not in chiropractic, but in other things like athletes knowing when they're overtraining. Yeah. Listen, right now my body just doesn't have it. I need to back off and having the coach be able to actually understand and do that because an athlete, they're just gonna push through. They're, they're like, yeah. I need to get this done. And that might not be smart and might lead to burnout. So that yeah. is not just an outcome measure. That is a daily test to see where I'm at. Yeah. I was listening to a, a episode of a podcast as well with a business consultant who's also a biohacker and he's all into trying different diets and things like that to just optimize performance for business people. And he actually recommends and for himself takes HRV every morning. And if his HRV is poor, he refuses to make major business decisions that day. Huh. And that's, that's amazing how it's like this whole thing. It's we in chiropractic look at this and it's applicable to us. And we know that the better adapting nervous system, if we can change this, is not only better for your aches and pains, but is better for the entire function of your entire body. And everybody else knows this. Yet we have people, our professionals, say chiropractics are nothing but an achy low back. And it's just mind boggling to me when we have studies like this, that like you have, when we know HRV changes, when we show this clinically, who wouldn't want that? And yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, you bet. On that note, uh, in the paper, chiropractic application, you say it is long theorized that subluxation ultimately interferes with the body's ability to adapt. Thus, the traditional purpose of chiropractic spinal adjustment is to correct neurological disturbance with the ultimate goal of improving adaptability. Now, I don't know if this is something that rattling off the top of your head, you're, we, we can really go into but I like to kind of explore mechanism. Um, and we've gone deep into like Christopher Kent's four dimensional model of subluxation in the past. I don't know if that's kind of mechanism that you tend to hold. How, if somebody were just ask you off the street, how like, okay, we understand that the, we want the nervous system to function better. How does adjusting subluxation in the spine improve adaptability in the nervous system? If somebody asked you off the street, what would you tell them? Or even another doctor? I would uh, say that, uh the misalignment might put uh, some pressure on the cord or nerve, but probably more uh, likely is uh, uh, tension, like um, John Grostick talked about in uh, his paper in the Chiropractic Research Journal, the first issue out of the Sid Williams uh, Research Center at Life College. That was the uh, portion hypothesis? Yeah. He talked about the dentate ligaments, tension on the cord. And so some kind of mechanical disturbance between a misaligned vertebra and the spinal nerves and or cord. And uh, not uh, 
I'm not familiar with specific mechanisms beyond that, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, I think just because the patient has a misalignment and even the tension on the cord and or nerves, it doesn't necessarily mean disturbance in neurological function. There still may be adequate nerve communication between the brain and the body. The patient has just adapted to that. Probably at first there was some interference, but patients uh, may not come in for years. And since that time, they may have adapted to that misalignment. I, I kind of think of the elderly lady in the grocery store uh, who I see, and she has got a severe scoliosis, and she's uh, 93 years old. And at one time, she probably had a lot of uh, uh, tension on her cord and nerves, and but she's getting along fine just looking at, at her. She's driving to the grocery store at the uh, ripe old age of 93. And yeah, structurally, she doesn't look very well, but uh, functionally, she's at least uh, from uh, just, look, just looking, she's getting along fine. Mm -hmm. Whether yeah. she has interference in her nervous system, that would have to be answered with an examination. But that's kind of an example. And Dee Dee Palmer, I think, uh, talked about uh, the patient with uh, straight backs versus curved backs. And he said sometimes the patients with curved backs are getting along better than the ones with so-called straight backs. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, a dissenter about uh, structure and function. I think that's probably the case, but not in all cases. That uh, we can have uh, abnormal structure, but the patient may have adapted to that. That's why we have to look closely to the nervous system as to whether we think they, at least for me, whether they need my care or not. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that a really complicated question, right? Right. One of the things that I like to we got to explore a lot is the different like mechanisms and looking at it specifically at upper cervical, I think is really easy. And I think that what you kind of brought up is, is, is huge, um, is that we can look at research for this and look at different changes that happen, let's say with upper cervical care. And I, I like that just because of the specificity. So we're using an example. Um, obviously there's other types of techniques that work amazingly, you have great changes with heart rate variability. Personally, I don't practice upper cervical, although the techniques that I use do have an upper cervical focus and make sure that that's clear. Um, but we can look at something like, uh, I love referencing upright MRI studies um, that uh, Scott Rose has done. And yeah. we can literally look, upper cervical subluxation can influence cerebrospinal fluid flow. Are there people who get adjusted who don't have that aberration of cerebrospinal fluid flow? Yes, you can look at Grossick's work and we can see dentate ligament issues and then that comes under fire. Yet when you go look at exercise physiologists and uh, different anatomists who have looked at the upper cervical region, they find that the dentate ligaments actually do insert in the entire upper cervical area, including into the suboccipital muscles that insert into the atlas. So yeah. that goes in, you can take upper cervical like knee chest, um, knee chest you can take upper cervical like ao you can even take some of these newer like fascial techniques like qsm3 which i'm not sure if you're familiar which works on that upper cervical suboccipital area and sees three-dimensional postural change right away and you yeah. can see exactly how that makes sense um you can look at the number of mechanoreceptors it gets more and more and more up towards the upper cervical spine and functional neurology is really taking that a lot so who would have thought that there's all these different mechanisms and we can stand there and we can argue about which one works in which case, and maybe some cases have presence of all of those, maybe cases have presence of one of those, and does it really matter if we're going to analyze for distortion of the nervous system, correct it, and find that it was correct and that we, our body saw improvement? Well, that's our job, and that's, that's, that's just what our job is. Yeah, I, I kind of leave uh, the mechanism, for me, I leave the mechanisms to the basic scientists, the anatomist and the physiologist. And, and uh, like you said, uh, I, I have a um, uh, foot in uh, research interest and also in practice. And like you said, uh, if uh, we have uh, evidence-based measure before the adjustment and we repeat it after the adjustment, we can see if the patient's better. Absolutely. According to the nerve function.
Thank you. So this, this case doc, it was, uh, we're just going to go into real quick. So the study you published, we had 16 patients recruited. Yes. We were measuring pre post adjustment. Yeah. Um, what I love in the line that you put in here, because let's be real, uh, when, when haters want to hate, they'll, they'll find the opportunity. So what are you going to hear? Oh, it was only 16 patients. But then the next line is, well, this number of patients is similar to the number of patients in an HRV study that was conducted at the UCLA School of Medicine, where 18 <laughs> patients participated. So before, before we get comments and everything like that, so that's been addressed. Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page there. Would we have loved to have 160 and not 16? I'm sure, but let's go with what we have, right? Um, yeah. We saw significant improvements, but one thing that you noted was that the largest improvements were observed when only one area was adjusted, which was the atlas in the upper cervical area. Um, and you did caution that because the people who only had atlas adjusted was the smallest amount, it does kind of limit clinical, not clinical, but statistical significance. Yeah. Um, through your process of what to adjust, when, what you saw change, I know it's probably gonna be more anecdotal. What what do you think about the results that you had with this study? Yeah, it, it is anecdotal. And uh, as you said, um, very small sample sizes. The Most patients got upper cervical adjustment, but there were, there were some, a few, who got um, pelvis only. And those uh, patients did almost as well as upper cervical. And I thought that was interesting. So That's maybe, really interesting. It's, maybe it's uh, the number of segments, the fewer the better, And but it's just theory, theory at this point. We need a lot more research. But um, yeah, that the 18 number of patients at the UCLA study that I, I kind of, uh, assume that there would be some criticism and, and fair criticism about the small sample size, 16 patients, but it's a start. It's a, a first step. And the way I set up the study, I kept recruiting patients until I got uh, a statistically significant difference from pre to post. And I got that around uh, 15. I, I thought I'll go one more, 16, still had statistical significance. And so I, I stopped the study at that point. I, I could have kept going. One of the things in research, you want to have um, kind of um, a wide sample variety rather than cherry pick. And consecutive patients is not cherry picking. It's everybody. It's not even uh, a a sample, it's everybody from uh, the moment I started to the moment I finished, that's everybody. It's only 16 uh, over a short period of time. And um, it should be noted that the pre and post in this study is just in one visit. It's not uh, pre and then uh, three weeks later. So that can, that's both a limitation, that's both a strength and a weakness. The, the weakness is it's just short term within five minutes after the adjustment. And so that begs the question, how long did that last? How long did the improvement last? Fair, fair question. The strength of it though, in my view, is that the improvement can be more confidently attributed to the adjustment. Nothing else was done in the five minutes. They were just in the office. They did not have a lifestyle change. They did not take medication. They didn't change medication, diet. There's no, none of that. So I'm more able, more confident, confidently, I can attribute, link the adjustment, the improvement to the adjustment, since that's the only thing that happened be, between pre and post. So that's a strength. Absolutely. So going forward, maybe uh, do both with uh, uh, looking at long term, but also looking at that short term with each visit. Yeah, well, I appreciate you doing the work for us. I think the pelvis only is fascinating. It's almost as though like Gonstead maybe knew a little bit of what he was talking about. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I, 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 I could I mean, we can both sit here and theorize as to why that would be the case. Yeah. 
Um, but that's what research is for. And I think you brought up a really good point is that, you know, the, obviously there's strengths, obviously there's weaknesses. There's there with every study. Um, you yeah. we can anticipate any negative comments, but people are always going to, they're just always going to find something. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how the more I was having a conversation with a practice members who's going through his, his, uh, his master's right now, um, master's in public health specific to uh, weight training and exercise physiology, um, publishing research on that. And he's looking at everything he said to me, you know, we were talking about evidence and um, cause he knows that we like to talk about science. And he's like, it's amazing how the more and more and more I learn about how research works, the more you can read any study and just interpret whatever you want. You can draw, you know, you, we have conclusions and we have r results, but you can interpret those results. And if you want to not like a study, you can go through the methods. There's no such thing as a perfect study. You can go through and you can pick apart, well, this is invalid because this, or this is invalid because this, all we can do is utilize it and just get better over time. That's all that we can do. And yeah, uh, I appreciate you're, you're, you doing you're right. that. You're right. Uh, we all have our bias. And even in uh, subluxation type chiropractic, uh, is it the lower spine that's more important? Is it the upper spine that's more important? And and like you say, you can go through a paper and uh, a, a person who does not like the study will find something. And, and it may be uh, scientifically, it may be trivial what they find. And that's where uh, being informed comes in. If somebody is nitpicking at something, it may be something uh -huh. serious or it may be something that doesn't matter. And that's, that's where uh, it, it, a person informing themselves and educating themselves to, to uh, answer this in their own mind. Okay, does that person have a point or not? And if they have a point, is it a deal breaker for this study or is it just something minor? Absolutely. Absolutely. And recognize their own bias. For me, purpose, for me personally, there is nothing that would ever, and people ask me this question all the time, especially the haters out there, there's nothing that would ever stop me from being a subluxation-based chiropractor. There's nothing that would ever stop me from correcting subluxation. It uh, reminds me of uh, BJ, one of BJ Palmer's lectures. He got the question at Lyceum one time. BJ, it was a question and answer time. BJ, has, have you known anybody to forsake the big idea? as they called it back then, getting the, the idea that subluxation was the, the main thing. And he said, no, I, I've never known anybody who really got the big idea that later let it go. And that's kind of what you just said. Right, yeah, there's, right. there's nothing that would ever stop me. But if I see a study that says, hey, maybe what I'm doing to address subluxation isn't the best and maybe something is better, that is what I'm looking for. And that's the kind of stuff that I that I like. And that's the reason yeah. I'm, I'm so happy that you published this and research like this because it begs more questions. And I hope that we continue to do studies like this that don't just try to push an agenda, but say, hey, this is what I found. This was pretty interesting. We should look at it to determine what can we do to deliver the best care possible. Yeah, um, and te technically and from a... From a scientific standpoint, if, if studies started coming out saying adjusting subluxations are bad for people, and we can define bad, and if the first study said that, and the second study, and done uh, with good design and unbiased people, then, then uh, we'd have to have second thoughts, but that's not the case. We, we see studies coming out uh, all the time showing patients are benefiting from chiropractic care, not just symptom wise, but um, neurophysiologically wise. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, that, and just to kind of go that route as well, is because of our personal observations and studies like this, if we had study after study after study after study that said, hey, correcting subluxation is not good. Um, well, I've clearly seen it and seen evidence that shows that it is good. So why in the people who were studied was it not good? Is there a way that we can differentiate and say maybe this one specific population of people uh, correcting subluxation, and this is just theoretical because I, there's no studies out there that say this, um, right. isn't good. Is there yeah. a way to differentiate? Because we know, not only based on the science, based on what we get to see every day, that it is positive and has a positive effect. So it's That's always honing and honing and honing and honing yeah. and honing. And luckily yeah. we have uh, people who understand that 
and do that? Well, that's, that's a great point that you make that, uh, okay, we might have study study in from academians showing that subluxation, adjusting subluxations is not a good thing versus chiropractors in practice who are seeing good results. They may not be publishing it, but they're in practice and they're staying in practice and they have patients coming to them. So it's, it's not just about uh, published research, chiropractors having practitioners, whoever, chiropractors, medical doctors, clinicians and their experience, that counts too. Yes. Yes. And uh, to clarify to people listening, this is 100% theoretical right now. There has not been study after study after study saying that correcting civilizations is bad as in, in any population. Uh, on, yeah. In fact, there's been study after study to the contrary. Um, exactly. We're just exploring a theoretical. And what yeah. you just said, Doc, I'm really glad because we're going to segue into uh, something I know we wanted to just talk about really quickly was that there are chiropractors out there who are getting positive results, um, who are doing it in practice and maybe aren't publishing it. And I know somebody who might be on this call who might be able to help them with you with that. Um, so can you just go really quickly, just talk a little bit about how if somebody is in that situation where they have all these positive results, they want to give back to the community um, or back to the profession, back to just the world, what they can do to get that information out there in a peer reviewed type setting. Well, as you uh, suggested, there there is somebody on the call who has a consulting service. And I've been uh, doing, I, I started in 1988 with my first case study in practice in uh, Blair, Nebraska. And I got it published in Palmer's Research Journal. And I had a, a faculty member there who's actually a physiologist, James Wood. And... Uh, good fella. And, and uh, he's since gone on to his reward, but he, uh, I was put in touch with him. And as a PhD, he had uh, experience in research and publication, and he helped me. He helped me each step of the way, and he was patient with me. And, and so um, I have uh, about 80 papers published since then in peer-reviewed journals. So I've, I've got some experience that I, I want to help others if they have the interest and they uh, want to uh, either begin or they have, like you said, uh, a case study already, but they're not sure which way to go. So I'm uh, happy to share my experience with others as Dr. Wood shared with me so that we can keep moving chiropractic, <clears throat> subluxation type chiropractic, including <clears throat> up a notch or two. And each, each one, uh, each contribution moves, moves the ball. But uh, in particular, I help um, a colleague formulate uh, an idea and uh, collect the data. I suggest people start out with a case study and they can contact me and I can uh, guide them on uh, what can be done. Um, sometimes there's something that can be measured. Once we have numbers, we can uh, uh, apply statistical methods, which is something unusual that I've been uh, bringing into my research. Uh, this study that we've been talking about was about a group of patients, but I'm, I've taken it a step further and applying it to an individual patient applying statistical methods of comparing two or three pre-readings to one post-reading to see if that post-reading is statistically unusual to the two or three beforehand. So that, that is unusual and it's controversial, but I, I do the homework, I show the graphs showing that the, it's not necessarily the number of patients, but the number of observations. And even though it's very small, say, three or four observations, as long as it satisfies the assumptions of the statistical test, and I lay that out, then, uh, then why not? Why not do it? And the, the benefit is that it becomes relevant to that patient, very relevant to that patient. Whereas a study done out here in academia on a group of patients where this patient did not participate, for one thing, 
it can't be related to that patient, but the, the research findings for that patient are very relevant for that patient. I can t say to the patient, this uh, finding after the adjustment is statistically unusual, this improvement, so it's probably due to the adjustment. And I'll keep that in mind the next time I see you, this type of adjustment. So that's a way of applying it in practice. So I help uh, the colleague formulate an idea and help uh, him analyze the data. Maybe he or she wants to compare a group of patients before and after taking blood pressure or taking heart rate. Don't, we don't need any special equipment. We don't need an app to take a heart rate at the wrist, just a, a watch or a timer on the phone. And that can be done in practice, taking resting heart rate on a group of consecutive patients before and after adjustment. And I can help uh, the, the colleague analyze that data. I can help uh, write the paper and I can help uh, submit the paper, help the colleague pick a journal and help with uh, answering the constructive criticisms of journal reviewers. And um, then I can help the colleagues celebrate once the paper is accepted. You can definitely help yeah. with the celebration. Uh, right? Yeah, I can help that. I don't need to know how these South Carolinans do that, but I'm sure it's fun. Well, it's not, just, too, it's not too different than New Jersey. Oh, I'm, I don't doubt that at all. I don't do doubt. It's just I'm sure the, uh, the, the, the base liquid is a little different, but all the same intent. Um, well, thank you so much. I think uh, just personally, just as a, a weird thank you, um, you just put something in perspective for me uh, because doing doing this, um, sometimes, you know, I, I told you I have two case studies under my belt. I have a third coming out um, and that's it. And I have this show. I do a lot. We have, you know, almost 50 episodes, but it's, it's not really much. And I kind of think about it. And sometimes, you know, I think imposter syndrome is really um, is is really apparent. And there's tons of people who listen to this who talk to me who are like, hey, I want to be doing more. I'm just so busy in practice. I, I don't know what to be doing. And for those of you guys who may feel the same way that I, I, I do, um, what Dr. Hart just mentioned was that his first study, case study published, was in 1988, which was 31 years ago. And I know that because I was born in 1989 and I'm 30. Okay. <laughs> so we have time. We, we have time. And looking at your, uh, your CV and looking at Cairo Index stuff, I think these last five years have been your best years of research that you've put out. Um, and I want to thank you for that well, thank because you. it's been yeah. really good. Um, so we have time. Thank you for the perspective yeah. there. A, a, lot, a, a, lot, a lot of it is interest. The, the more burning the interest, the more likely it's going to get done. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know you were telling us about your consulting service. So uh, if you want to tell anybody who's interested how they can reach out to you and talk about that, as well as if you have any parting, guiding words of wisdom for anybody, please, now this sure. is your time. My email is the letter J, heart, without the E, dc at yahoo.com. And if you guys are watching this, the video version, not the audio version, I just put it up on the screen for you. All right. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off there. And um, just um, just some parting thoughts. If if there's something uh, that you're interested in, uh, pursue it in practice. Maybe there's some other aspect uh, like heart rate or some other measure. I would encourage you uh, to follow your dreams, whether it's uh, other aspects of life or uh, research pursue it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, Doc. Um, this Thank was a great, inviting me. yeah, it was my pleasure. This was fun. Um, for those of you guys listening, I hope you guys got some value out of this. Um, if you guys want this study in patient newsletter format, like I said, CairoEdgeMedia.com, but you've been listening, you know that. Um, I hope you guys have a great week. Go slay some subluxations and I love you all.